Next to China, state media there says the Chinese lunar probe has successfully taken off from the far side of the moon to start its journey back to Earth. The Chang'e 6 module landed on Saturday in a volcanic basin close to the moon's south pole and has collected samples of rock and soil. They're expected to be very different from rock formations on the near side of the moon. The Chinese National Space Administration called the mission an unprecedented feat in lunar exploration. Uh, the probe is due to return in about three weeks' time to a landing site in Inner Mongolia. Now let's hear now from our China correspondent, Laura Becker. They're calling this remarkable, historic. It's even trending on social media here. Their channel called Weibo, um, especially because the mechanical arm that was used to collect those rock and soil samples has put the symbol for Chongguo, which is uh, China, into the earth on the far side of the moon. They've also planted uh, the Chinese flag on the far side of the moon. Now, the reason why scientists are so excited by this is because it's very, very difficult to control and even land and get an aircraft to take off from the far side of the moon because there's no line of sight from Earth. So what China did was they launched a satellite which was there by April and ready for this mission. And they've used that satellite to relay messages. So for the last two days, the Chang'e 6 space probe has been collecting these precious rock and soil samples. Now, the other reason scientists are very interested in this is because the in previous samples that you can see, the bit of the moon that you can see, they've collected the samples that look very volcanic, look very like you would see in Iceland or Hawaii. However, it is thought that the rocks on the far side of the moon could contain traces of ice. Now, that would mean there is some kind of source of water on that part of the moon. The reason scientists get excited by that is they are hoping one day to build some kind of space station up there and it is hoped that perhaps it could sustain life. We're way off that but right now China believes it's way ahead when it comes to this kind of lunar exploration. Thanks to Laura for that. Right, we can speak now to astrophysicist Professor Quentin Parker from the University of Hong Kong. Thanks for coming on the programme. Pleasure. So what do you make, first of all, of just the challenge that has been successfully completed so far? We'll get on to the rocks and the ice in a moment, but just the logistics of doing what's been done so far, what do you make of it? Well, it's never been done before in terms of a, a lunar sample return mission from the far side. Now, China has already landed on the far side. When it did that, uh, with Chang'e 4, that was the first time that's ever been done as well. And now it's the second time they've gone back to the far side, and this time they've done it to bring back uh, lunar rock and soil samples. So that is uh, very complicated. As was said by the previous speaker, there's no direct line of sight, so you have to have a relay satellite called the uh, Chukwa, and that basically means Magpie Bridge. The Chinese love having these interesting and lovely names for their missions. And that's kind of in a, what's called an L2 orbit around the moon that allows a direct line of sight from the lander to the satellite, from the satellite back to the Earth. So you can remain in, in, in communication at all times, which is vital for a mission of this type. So it's very complicated, very challenging technically. They've done it again. And now, just like the Chang'e 5, which is on the near side, they're now going to be bringing back, we hope, lunar rock from the, from the far side rather than the near side. Right, let's get on to this rock then. How much of it have they grabbed and what's going to happen to it now? Um, they probably grabbed about the same amount as last time with Chang'e 5, because the uh, Chang'e 5 uh, mission and Chang'e 6 are basically the same in terms of the intent to go to the moon and bring back sample. About two kilograms is what they expect to bring back. OK, and what happens to it now when it's back on Earth? Well, I mean, assuming they can get it back to Earth um, first, um, there's still a few hairy bits to go. They, you know, they've gone back from lunar, uh, from, the, from the surface of the moon in, into the spacecraft that will then bring it back to the Earth. They're going to transfer the sample into the, the module, that uh, re-entry vehicle, that actually mustn't burn up in the atmosphere and come back safely to, to land in, in Mongolia. And once all of that happens, if it all does happen, because there's pretty scary parts there, uh, then they'll just uh, very carefully, like the Americans did with the um, asteroidal uh, material that they recovered, uh, carefully unpack and, and extract the material from within the lander. And what will they be looking for? 
Well, as was said previously, I mean, the far side of the moon looks very, very different to the near side. On the near side, you have all these mare, you know, like Sea of Tranquility, which big lava fields from volcanic activity. That's pretty much absent from the far side of the moon for reasons that aren't completely understood. What you see on the far side is a much, you know, very cratered terrain. Lots of bombardment happened, like on the near side, but it hasn't been uh, washed over by volcanic lakes like it has on the near side. And so we think the geology is very different. And down in the South Pole, there are craters there which have high walls protected from sunlight at all times. And in those craters, we think there might be water ice and helium and other precious materials, which will be of great use to, to future exploration of the moon and even to habitation. Interesting. And what does all this, as you, you've, you've highlighted again the caveats, not over yet, not safely back no. yet, we appreciate those caveats, <laughs> but, but if we presume that that does all go swimmingly, what does this do, uh, do you think, for the country's space endeavours? Um, well, China's... Uh, Moon, uh, spacefaring uh, events have been going gangbusters, I would say, for about 10 years. You know, they've had a very successful Chang'e series of uh, lunar missions. They've also gone to Mars. They've also built a space station and about to put up a two-meter class optical telescope like the Hubble but with a field of view 350 times larger. So there's lots of things happening in the Chinese space program. This is just one of the most exciting. So the, the lunar missions have, uh, haven't failed. They've all been uh, successful so far. And everybody, uh, all any lunar scientist, any geologist uh, worth his salt or her salt will be praying that this sample comes back in a pristine condition so it can be studied. And so, you know, it's going to be a veritable cornucopia of scientific delights, I think, that's going to come out from the geology of these different samples from the far side and, and the near side. And these samples are, are being shared. I mean, we got a sample of Hong Kong U, you know, and my uh, deputy director, Joe Machowski, is American, worked a lot with NASA. He's going to be, wor he's working with that near side sample right now. And we hope to get a far side sample too. And around the world, I think Manchester University's got access to the Chang'e 5 near side moon rock. So, you know, it's not just China here. I mean, it's international collaboration, which is great. Just Absolutely fascinating. Professor Quentin Parker, thank you very much for explaining it so clearly. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much.